This is Phil Chen. I am Decentralized Chief Officer of HTC Exodus. And here we have the lock, uh, Galia Bonarzi, the co-founder of Bancor. Here to talk about everything from the future of tokens to what money is fundamentally, uh, to really and to really start with how Galia got started in um, this whole decentralized token industry. Cool. Uh, what inspired you? Uh, you know the stuff you did before Bancor. You know what got you to this point. Cool. Thanks for having me. Um, so Bancor, as some context, is a decentralized liquidity protocol. It is a standard for tokens that lets any token be exchangeable for any other token um, in a very automated, uh, fair way with transparent pricing, um, outside of exchanges, um, and in a way that really empowers what we see as the future of the token economy, which is a democratized ecosystem of value creation, and of token creation. Um, and so that's interesting, but if you can quickly explain the difference between a liquidity market and an exchange. Yeah, right, absolutely. People are, I think most people are very familiar with yeah, exchanges. Yeah, absolutely. So an exchange is how we've been um, exchanging assets and now digital assets for hundreds of years. It's basically a, a marketplace where buyers and sellers uh, come together and everyone puts in what are called bids and asks, so what I'm selling and what I'm looking to buy. And the marketplace, whether it's um, you know manual like in a shook or whether it's uh, digital like in the New York Stock Exchange, um, the marketplace is uh, matching buyers and sellers, yeah. right? And of course, in order to do that, you need a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers because everyone's got a different price that they're willing to pay uh, or sell for. And you want to find those matches and that's how we uh, do price discovery today. A liquidity network, which is what we work on at Bancor and is for the first time really enabled thanks to blockchain and smart contracts. Smart contracts are like computer programs that are on the blockchain, meaning they can't be changed, they just run as they are um, or as they were uh, designed. A liquidity network basically uh, allows any buyer and any seller to uh, transact with a robotic, if you will, smart contract. Uh, so anyone can buy what they are looking for from the smart contract sure. and everyone can sell what they have to the smart contract. Um, the smart contract has a computer program in it, in our case it's the Bancor formula. Mm -hmm. They'll always tell the buyer or the seller what is the current price at which that buyer or that sell can happen. That price is calculated based on how much of that asset exists in the network and how much of that asset is being asked to either be bought or sold. So it's a balancing formula. It will always balance supply with demand and it will display that price to the user, whether it's a buyer or a seller, um, similar to like a vending machine, mm -hmm. right? So uh, rather than a marketplace where uh, I might have a Coca-Cola and I'd like a Sprite so I'm looking for someone else sure. to trade with, a vending machine lets you approach and select what you want and pay with the currency that you have. And so you can and think of- the vending of, machine is, is the best kind of uh, prototypical smart contract. Exactly. Right? And you can think of the Bancor network as a vending machine that's full of tokens mm -hmm. and you can pay with any token you have um, and you can you get any token that you want that's available in the vending machine. Um, the really significant difference here, because for most people, uh, the, the end result is the same. I've got token A and I want token B, so I approach this network or this exchange and I give what I have and I get what I want. For most users, the, the end result is similar, but um, in the background, what's happening is very, very different. It's it has fundamentally some different. Fundamentally different. It has some, like you say, fundamental implications yes. around what we can do and, and um, and can't do in currency um, and in value creation. And I'll, I'll explain. So in the traditional model where you're matching people, um, you have a big problem, which is people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people's behavior within yeah. these markets. What do I mean by that? Um, is that oftentimes uh, we experience problems in these markets, in these um, exchanges, whether they're traditional exchanges or crypto exchanges, even decentralized crypto exchanges, which is that um, they're somewhat easy to manipulate. 
Um, for example, you can be both the buyer and the seller uh, mm -hmm. on the same trade. Um, in the regular markets, that's illegal, though it still happens frequently and it's very hard to track. Um, and in crypto markets, it's maybe not yet illegal because the regulation hasn't developed. But it's um, even easier. But it's even easier um, for, uh, for folks to do this um, due to the sure. uh, anonymity of the technology sure. and the global nature of it. And of course, the, the um, lack of standards uh, that exist today. Um, when you have the same person on both sides of a trade, what you're creating is misinformation sure. um, to other buyers because they think activity is happening around a digital asset, but really you're creating that activity, right. making it look, you know, it's market, it's market making and it's marketing and it's hype. Um, and many, Not many consumers are hurt by this uh, ability to manipulate the bid and ask process. If you think there's activity, but there isn't, you're overpaying sure. uh, for an asset. And soon that asset is likely to uh, decrease in value and, and you're left holding it without that information. Um, so that's one way things can be manipulated. Price collusion. Sure. You and me as separate buyers and sellers can agree behind the scenes to a price that is either over or under uh, what's currently considered market price. That also creates misinformation. Mm -hmm. The really uh, innovative part about the Bancor protocol, um, the significant part for users, is that you can't cheat a smart contract. Sure. You can't collude with a smart contract. You can't buy and sell from yourself. You can buy mm -hmm. and then sell, sure. But you're getting the same price information that sure. everyone else is getting. And so what Bancor protocol uh, suggests to the world is a new method for the exchange of digital assets. By the way, this, can, this method can be used by the stock market. This method can be used by the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. They know how many shares are out there of the different assets that they uh, are listing and offering in their marketplaces. Um, and this buy and sell technology can be used to really deal with many of the problems that we see in traditional markets and now um, especially in crypto markets. Um, another really significant difference about doing exchange in this way is that you really separate the volume from the liquidity. What do I mean by that? Because the smart contract is always willing to buy from you or sell to you, you don't need a thousand buyers yeah. uh, or hundreds of thousands of buyers in order to find a match between the price asked and the price offered. You have a smart contract, you have a price, even one buy is enough to execute that transaction. Um, and why is that especially significant in our conversation today? Because when you're talking about democratizing access, when you're talking about anyone can do this, anyone can use these tools, anyone can make a token, if the requirement for your token to be liquid on a market is that first you have a lot of volume, you're locking a lot of people out. And you're creating a chicken and egg type of incentive where in order for my token to work, and by work I mean be tradable, I have to have a lot of people trading it. But in order for a lot of people to be trading it, I need it to work, mm -hmm. right? And so this chicken and egg paradigm means that only the most savvy technical teams can create tokens, only the most heavily capitalized teams can create tokens, um, and only the most, let's say, uh, marketing uh, enabled teams can create tokens. Um, what we really want to see at Bancor is bringing this technology to its rightful place, which is everyone, which is the public, um, and letting uh, anyone create a token which is liquid and viable from day one. Sure. So speaking of this kind of democratizing access to, to tokens and creation of tokens, and one of the things that inspired me in, 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 in where we met at Oslo Freedom Forum yeah. is, is how you started, right? Uh, tell us about that story. Tell yeah. about that story of the Love Coin and, and yeah. how it began. Absolutely, and it's a good, uh, it's a great memory from Oslo Freedom Forum because most of our time we spend, uh, you know, giving these presentations to either tech uh, mm -hmm. industry audiences or uh, cryptocurrency or financial audiences, and to speak about these topics uh, at the Oslo Freedom That's Forum, right. where you know the audience is focused on freedom on the fundamental human right, on helping folks um, escape from uh, dictatorships or different uh, different problems that are, are happening around the world is, you know, it's the real calling, um, I 
think of our time and, and of the space that we're in. So it's a great honor for me, and I'm so glad that I met you there. Yeah. Um, so, and, but also, just yeah. you know, crypto is. I mean, for me too, it is about human dignity. Right, especially what we're doing with empowering people with their private keys, Absolutely. data. You know, it's trying to empower people for the human dignity that they own and they're rightful. Yeah. And so that's what I love about what you're doing. But yeah, tell us Thanks. how it began. Um, began. Yeah. So the story that I told and, and that I often tell is that when uh, my team and I, we've been tech entrepreneurs for a long time. I grew up in Palo Alto, California, kind of the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and when we discovered, when we heard about Bitcoin um, in 2011, 2012, um, for the first time, uh, while the technologists were you know, incredibly inspired by the new cryptography paradigm, I was incredibly inspired by the first user-generated money. Um, whoever Satoshi is, he, she, they, they created um, a brand new money into society and that money is being used to whatever degree it's currently being used and whatever degree it will be used in the future. Um, and coming from an internet background and kind of consumer application background, um, what we know from the internet is that whenever there is one user generated something, uh, user generated video, user generated blog, user generated forum, uh, like on Reddit, a subreddit, user generated group, like on Facebook, there will soon be hundreds of millions of those user generated um, pieces of content. And so for us, Bitcoin represented the first user generated token. And we began to really think about a world with hundreds of millions of user generated tokens, or just tokens uh, for short. Um, and we started building uh, software that would let people interact with that world. So our first product um, was basically a token generator. Um, it let folks, whether they were heads of communities or uh, store owners, uh, issue a currency uh, for their group. And then we created a marketplace which let uh, users of that currency buy and sell different uh, goods and services. Um, through an easy to use uh, mobile phone app. Uh, and what we saw over the next couple years uh, really rocked us uh, to our core, if you will, in terms of our understanding uh, of what money is. Um, so I'll give you, I'll give the example that, that I gave about Hearts. One of the currencies that was created on our platform was called Hearts, and it was a token for moms. Um, there was a community of mothers, there was about 40,000 moms in this group, that before having hearts would exchange a lot of information about you know different uh, topics that are interested especially to new mothers interesting um, different goods and services available like kind of like a bulletin board or a message board and when they started using hearts basically everyone downloaded this application to their phone all of the moms uh, received uh, like a hundred hearts to get started and then there was all these there were all these ways that uh, they could earn more hearts by being active within the community. So, you know, things like um, volunteer at this school on this holiday, they really need help, uh, you know, at the door or some event that they're doing, or, um, you know, donate to this charity that we all are uh, supportive of and every um, for every money that you give to them, you'll get hearts in the marketplace. Um, so they could earn hearts. And then all the moms could upload to the marketplace goods and services that they were willing to sell for hearts. So for many people that was stuff that was in their house, like uh, a stroller that they didn't need anymore, a bike, uh, clothes that didn't fit anymore, you know, kind of like a, um, a Craigslist or like a secondhand market for the community. Um, for many moms that was services, like um, I can bake a great cake for your child's birthday party or I am an expert in um, a certain kind of education method that you might want to learn about or I can walk your dog. Um, and so moms could earn hearts and spend hearts within this community and in the next year we saw we saw just incredible data from this small, small pilot, which things like thousand transactions per day between you know 40,000 total users in this marketplace, um, 30 minutes in the app per day. These are kind of Facebook engagement level numbers um, in terms of you know how much you're browsing and ch chatting with the other moms uh, in the marketplace about the items and, and the exchanges. Um, 
25 million dollars worth of commerce um, in the year only in hearts without a dollar changing hands um, and so as we're kind of watching this unfold and learning what we realized was that wow that's 25 million dollars worth more to the GDP. Mm -hmm. you know, that's you, unaccounted for. Yeah, that's unaccounted for. Yeah. Um, of course, the, G, the, the folks who figure out the GDP weren't counting hearts, um, and, and we don't necessarily expect them to, but in economic terms, if we want to talk about how mm -hmm. much economic collaboration is happening sure. within a society, you know, this $25 million of hearts commerce is real economic collaboration. It's goods and services changing hands. If they had done this all in dollars, we would count that in GDP.